It's uh, my pleasure uh, to make this introduction. Uh, and uh, we have uh, today a very high level panel, and I'm honored to, to welcome Commissioner uh, Uttinger here, who is all, all, always uh, very keen to, to be present to our uh, seminars that we organize, to Dr. Fatih Birol, who is the chief economist of the International uh, Energy Agency, and to Rainer Zier, the chairman of Wintersal. Uh, uh, so you see, we have a very distinguished audience uh, present uh, here. So in the uh, ALDI group, um, we believe uh, uh, very uh, much in a strong common energy uh, policy. Why? Because how you can describe it, uh, energy is the food of our industry. And industry is the basis of our uh, economy. So uh, a common approach uh, on the issue of the food for our uh, industry on energy uh, is absolutely uh, uh, necessary to secure efficiency, security, and supply, and that, uh, if possible, at uh, competitive prices. And I can tell you that in the three years past since the beginning of the uh, uh, parliamentary uh, mandate, uh, our group organized uh, many conferences on energy policy uh, to provide debate, of course, uh, but also as a source of inspiration for policy solutions. And we have looked to, to nearly every uh, type of energy. To, we looked to solar energy. Uh, we had made, we did uh, uh, a seminar on, on renewables, uh, also on nuclear energy, following Fukushima, on liquefied natural gas, and also at uh, on the issue of emission uh, trading uh, uh, system, and even at hydrogen as a source of energy uh, for uh, transport. So many of our uh, maps are also uh, very active in a number of energy-related uh, um, reports. Adri Adina Valian uh, is co-rapporteur uh, co on Connecting Europe facility. Fiona Hall is uh, uh, very uh, active in the important directive on energy efficiency. And Kent Johansson, another uh, member of our group, is playing an important role in the Horizon uh, 2020 uh, research uh, program. And today, under the initiative of Jürgen Kreutzmann, uh, we uh, uh, want to tackle one aspect of this complex interconnected web of uh, issue and uh, the importance of the gas pipelines bringing energy, uh, energy to Europe's uh, industry. So what is clear is that gas will play a major role as a source of energy in the next decades. Um, it's cleaner than coal, it's safer than nuclear energy, and uh, some even say that we are entering a golden age of gas. Uh, and it's up to the experts to debate this today and, and, and uh, to uh, confirm this or not to confirm it. What we believe is that we need secure and diversified uh, source of energy supply uh, who can be produced uh, in uh, Europe, and um, we should be able to enter um, Europe through various entry points, and then what is needed that uh, this can circulate freely and efficiently uh, throughout the European uh, continent. And actually, we should also uh, ensure a stable regulatory framework uh, which uh, facilitates investment and provide for necessary public financial support uh, without uh, distorting uh, the markets. So you see uh, a huge number of uh, issues related uh, to uh, the topic, and uh, I'm very pleased uh, that you are here, and I give the floor to Dr. Kreitzmann to introduce the speakers and also uh, to lead a fruitful debate, I hope, uh, uh, this afternoon. Jürgen. Yeah, thank you very much, Guy. Um, also, I know that uh, our Commissioner Oettinger is uh, speaking English in an excellent way, but I now would move to German. We have a translation in English and German. And um, I will continue. First of all, also zuerst möchte ich mich herzlich bedanken, Herr Kommissar. Ich weiß, uh, welche Terminenenge Sie immer haben, aber dass Sie uns zugelobt haben. Um, Sie alle werden Kommissar Oettinger kennen. Er ist uh, seit... Uh, dieser Legislaturperiode seit 2009 zuständig für Energie. Und er hat ja äh, jetzt die Energieeffizienzrichtlinie, haben wir jetzt gerade im Trilogverfahren beendet. Efficiency, efficiency has just been completed. And I, as a Euro-Deputy, uh, 
parliamentarian can uh, talk about the different reg uh, ag <clears throat> agreements that have been concluded. Uh, and we're also working on a compromise. We agreed to compromise with, because it's better what we had than what we had before. Uh, then Farid Byrol is the chief economist for the International e Energy Agency, who will also weigh in on the important discussion. discussion. Then we have Dr. Rainer Seele, who is the chairman of the Wintersaal AG, uh, one of the big uh, consumers, for one of the big distributors for Russian gas in Europe. And before I give the word to the commis commissioner, uh, I've read in the Handelsblatt and that the uh, economy minister of, of Bavaria said that there will be 3,000 to 4,000 megawatt will be of capacity will be replaced with um, gas power and sh shoal gas that is uh, being produced in America. If, uh, the price of 13 US dollars for 18.4 uh, uh, cubic meters of, ga of gas. And that the low level of, en of energy prices allows us to uh, readdress investments into the chemical program. We are very skeptical of the monopoly the, of Gazprom. How can we, diver can we diversify? How can we really diversify and put our basis uh, approach to energy provision on broader shoulders? Thank you, President. Mr. Kreutzmann, Dr. Sed, Mr. Mer uh, Dr. Barrow, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very grateful for the active interest in energy policy and your availability to continue the Europeanization of the energy policy together with the European po uh, Commission. Guess. What, what about the developments in our view? What is the role of the, um, of the European and worldwide gas market? First of all, within the 27 member states, we have a gas consumption of approximately 530. In 2020-2030, we think approximately 600 billion cubic meter instead of 550 billion. Our proper our prop our proper our prop our gas hören Sie mich? Do you hear me? No? Uh, die in den Niederlanden den Energiemarkt veränderten, aber ausgehend von beiden Ländern ganz Europa veränderten. Russische und algerische Gasimporte kamen dann mit wachsen. Have uh, have joined these imports with rising impacts, but our own, our proper gas is, uh, you can't hear me, we have a problem here, we have a problem. Uh, public service announcement from the interpreters, please, if you want to listen to English, switch to channel 2 on your personal console. Gas imports. Unsere Strategie heißt, Diversifikation und Wettbewerb. Wir wollen Quellen diversifizieren und wollen im Wettbewerb. We want to uh, to enforce the consumers in the competitiveness in the competitive uh, market and reduce our dependency. Guess once was a product in a regional market. It was always limited through pipeline, pipeline routes which were limited. By now, gas has become a European product. It's a pan-European product. We're not dependent anymore. Not only there's the continentalization of gas through liquefied natural gas and uh, the Caspian area towards China and Europe 
through all of this, we are now in a process of globalization of gas. Gas is becoming a project which is globally available, globally tradable and relevant for the worldwide gas market. In the U United States, we observe a very interesting development. Once the United States were an importer of gas, a very huge importer of gas, they are now on the best way to become independent of importations. Shell gas and other unconventional gas discoveries have uh, have given rise to this. And I think that shell gas will be will play an increasing role also in Europe but it will not uh, replace conventional gas, it will just um, be complementary to it. And I do think that our own um, gas discoveries will, uh, will be reducing, will be replete, depleting quicker than new discoveries. When we talk of shale gas, there are no rules on a European level. We do have rules governing uh, governing the the groundwater or governing environmental aspects, but we don't have any regulations ruling shale gas. We do think that the European Union and its member states have an option and must keep this option of unconventional gas. And we should not um, we should not limit ourselves by introducing limitations. We do observe the observations in this area, the develop the development in this area. And in the next years, I will also keep reservations in this area. We do think that. Europe might be happy one day about shale gas as a complementary measure that can be used in, a, in an environmentally friendly way. Russia is our number one partner as an importer for the European Union. Norway is second on list. Algeria, of course, is our number three. We want to keep and to maintain these three partnerships and uh, see a chance for a growing market with advantages for all the three partners, rising volumes for all the three of them. We want to open the Southern Corridor and I'm very happy to announce that a few hours ago we have accomplished a step in this direction in Baku and Ankara. The International Convention of Azerbaijan and Turkey has now been signed and has established the basis for our partners of Azerbaijan and Turkey in a way that uh, will uh, that crosses the whole of Turkey. The Trans Anatolia pipeline is possible in this way. Tanab is just one piece, one element in the Southern Corridor. And we are convinced that tomorrow the decision will be taken whether in whether next to TAP into the in the direction of Greece and Italy, SEP developed by BNP or Nabucco West, which has been developed by us, will be part of the final decision. Nabucco West is further developed and is uh, planned in a much more concrete way, much concreter way. So we suppose that next to TAP, Nabucco West will probably be uh, will be the best option tomorrow, hopefully. The strategy of diversification with three different instruments is our focus, routes, sources, and distributors. All three of them are important. A new source with a new route is particularly of particular value. 
a new root is of value. And a new distributor with a new source and a new root is the best option for our European competitiveness, our European market. We have learned from our errors in 2008-2009. Member states must save their gas supplies for 30 days, and this is very, eff very efficient. And we are continuing to, we have, we have new measures, we activate new distributors, we, con we, we, we thus obtain, less, we are less dependent, and in this way we cannot be we could not be put on, under strain. Our infrastructure and our Connecting Europe facility, our proposal for a budget, our priorities and boat projects that are in the common interest of, of the European Union. We want to define all of these and this brings three important proposals on the table. Infrastructure must be developed further, and we're in the best way. I invite the European Parliament to contribute within the next six and fifteen, six to fifteen months, to be a counselor to us in the process, and to think about the question whether gas distribution networks must be co-financed and how they can be ratified quicker, how they can be accepted quicker and how they can be built. In your party, the European... The it is clear that between Germany and Italy, between the Netherlands and the Czech Republic, our conduct between the Baltic Sea and Central Europe well, this is a, is a business interest. We need these volumes in the market, and the consumers and the stakeholders can pay without giving rise to, to price rises. But I call upon your intelligence. Connect Malta to Sicily, to Italy, to integrate the Baltic states that are now connected to Russia only by 100% and the construction of a new terminal in the Baltic area or the use of gas in the eastern Mediterranean region, Cyprus, for the European region. All of this is financed by the market only and created by investors only. If we want the inner market and the market with the periphery of the European Union, and if we want to link north and south from the Baltic Sea to Croatia, for example, then we must create financial incentives and we must offer co-financing possibilities. There are 60 projects within the program ERP, which was very important to you in the Parliament, and for which 2.5 million euros were allocated. With this, with the projects that have uh, built upon these co-financial um, sums, we, we have shown that we are efficient. We want to change the inner market and implementation of both packets of, is uh, are very important to us. Transparency is important, access for all parties, these are key words for us. We do think, we do believe that gas plays an important role, a never more important role, and is the ideal partner for a growing part of renewable energies. Water and biomass, photovoltaic energies, 
or wind energy are not the same. They do not offer the same possibilities. Gas is the ideal complementary measure because it can be used, it can be interrupted and can be switched on quickly and without delay. But also gas needs to be amortized over a certain amount of time. 1,500 hours per year are not enough. We need 3,000 or more hours per year. Only then it is also fi financed by investors. Mark design and capacity markets are key words here. But in reality, we must ask the question, do we allow sub uh, subsidies? Do we allow co-financing in an inner market which is supposed to live without co-financing and subsidies? I will offer several proposals how we can design a market in a way that it does not lead to a perfect planning economy or to design it in a digressive way. I will propose this in the forthcoming months and we will have um, we will have uh, further developments in the Commission in October and November this year. The interesting projects, we know that the partners will not only take up the second pipeline of North Stream in the autumn, but there should be a third and a fourth pipeline uh, that are tested, that have an uh, that are tested upon their environmental friendliness. The North Sea might have a transit function not only for 55 billion, but for more than 100 billion cubic meters. South Stream has been announced. We don't know enough about it. We are neutral and we are objective, fair and positive towards any possible route. But I'm curious whether the technical risks in the Black Sea, which is not a simple access to the Baltic Sea, whether these technical issues will be controllable, or whether we will have similar risks that we have that we had in the Baltic Sea, and then we have another issue, which is the Ukraine. The Ukraine is our neighbor and our common. Uh, problem problematic neighbor we should do any anything that we can not to not to create an enemy here in any way political economical this is why we're looking for solutions how we can include the Ukraine in the energy sector um, how we can give them a role here with transit routes for gas and oil we are already doing preparations. We are trying to find what the renovation of existing gas pipelines that cross the Ukraine um, are, are costing. We are prepared to co-finance together with the World Bank. Financing these pipelines is in, in, in each case will be less financial. Uh, uh, a lesser financial burden than creating a new one and creating a consortium, thus uh, passing on the restructured pipelines and creating a consortium with Gazprom in Russia on the one hand, the Ukraine on the other hand, and European industrial investors on the third place will be a complementary solution. We call upon the Ukraine to become a transit partner for gas in the European Union for gas from Russia uh, in the long term. And I would then like, I would also like to say that the energy partnership is very important, that the European economic area is important, and only through one of these areas in Europe we can create investors, we can create Con confidence for investments, the Ukraine, Norway, and we also plan. We also plan to have a, an ever more 
str an ever stronger basis with Algeria so that investors can be confident in the common market rules. I don't exclude that gas will play an important role in traffic. And I think that we all should not only pay attention to batteries and electric engines, but we when we buy a car, but it might be that gas will be an environmentally friendly solution for the automotive sector as well in the future, in the next 10 years. And gas also needs CCS. If by 2050 we want to have an economy that is free of CO2, as the one called upon by Parliament and Council, then in approximately 20 years, we will not be able to have gas without CCS. And for this reason, this is a topic which is important to all of us, not only the carbon industry, but also the gas industry and the whole of the energy, uh, energy industry depend on this. I want to contribute to your interesting topic. Of course, I'm very interested to hear the next presentations. If I have to leave in a few minutes, this is not because I'm not interested, but we have some very important discussions in the European Council. I am, of course, very happy to see that this is a priority for your work and we are prepared for cooperation in this area. Thank you very much, Mr. Commissioner. I'm very happy that you have prepared for this topic and that you can uh, you were able to prepare so many different aspects now we have time to ask some questions to the commissioner and then we will ask the next speakers to continue with the speeches other questions will be put to the end of the conference other questions vielen dank uh, I'm a member of the ITRA committee. Uh, Mr. Commissioner, I'm the rapporteur on the sale gas, and now we are at the phase of the amendments. My biggest problem is with the term whether gas is a short, medium, or long-term alternative. And including ALDE, the strong arguments are that it is of a short, duration. Now, if we recall the communication the Commission had, <coughs> you, call you refer to gas as a short to medium um, alternative. The way I see that, <coughs> and the way you described gas for the future, because I happen to be the rapporteur on the roadmap 2050 as well. And I have to be sure, what do I do with the gas? Is this a long-term investment? Because we talked about the pipelines. These are very expensive projects. And we have to be sure whether gas is a short, a medium, okay. or long-term alternative. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have also an MEP who has a question to the Commissioner, please. Uh, thank you, Chairman. My name is Roger Helmer. Uh, I'm a member of the United Kingdom Independence Party, and I speak for the party on industry and energy. Um, I, I really have two questions. First, um, does the Commission recognize that its emissions targets could be achieved uh, more safely, more securely, and more cheaply by a policy based on gas plus nuclear rather than a policy based uh, on renewables is my first question. Uh, and my second question is, uh, the emphasis seems to be primarily on pipelines and transportation of gas, uh, which seems to imply the assumption that we're going to continue to use Russia and Azerbaijan and, and sources like that. 
We've mentioned shale gas in passing, and in today's news there was considerable, uh, there was a report of, of uh, progress in Germany uh, and increased estimates of the availability of shale gas in Germany. There is shale gas in Poland, there is shale gas in the United Kingdom, there's an awful lot of shale gas. Have we taken that adequately into account? And the next thing beyond shale gas uh, is the whole question of methane hydrates, which can probably provide more energy as natural gas than the whole of all other fossil fuel uh, known deposits uh, in the world. So gas is in a state of flux. Gas is rapidly becoming available from shale gas uh, and will become available from uh, methane hydrates. Uh, should we have so much emphasis on transporting gas from old sources rather than developing new sources. Thank you very much. We take a, a third question, and then I ask the commissioner to respond. Please. Uh, Chairman, thank you. Mark Johnston from WWF in Brussels. I mean, briefly on, on gas and gas in relation to climate. Um, there's an important debate to be had, but we think it would be more important for this and other institutions like it to focus on the instruments that will uh, set boundaries for gas use and set standards for gas use rather than only promoting the fuel, which is what many are doing at present uh, in and around the institution. But the question in particular, Commissioner, in relation to your remarks on the October communication, the progress report on uh, the energy and the electricity and the gas internal market, um, to be frank, we're at a loss about what could be done that's new for Europe within the context of that report. I mean, so could you say more about what you intend to say in that report? Would it lead to a reopening of the third package, for example? Could it lead to a fourth internal market package? Uh, and would, it, would either of those options have uh, political support in this House and in the Council for amending legislation in those ways? Thank you very much. Herr Kommissar Dinger. Commissioner Oettinger, please. in all of institutions, of the institutions, especially strongly in the parliament, there is a tendency towards renewable energy. There are people who completely refuse fossil fuel. And there are people who are in support of fossil fuel who, are, who have a skeptic view of renewable energies. I think we should as Europeans consider all primary energy sources, all technologies, we should include all of those in our energy policies. And the idea that a country like Germany, that right now has 55% coal power, 40, which had before 43% nuclear energy, that they completely turn off nuclear energy, that, uh, that they will lose 43% of their energy supply in 10 years. Will, they will not be able to avoid relying on coal for a long time. This is an important element. Secondly, we have to reinforce, uh, ask the question of can we actually pay this in Europe? In some countries, especially in the industry-heavy countries like Italy or Germany, we are really walking the line here as far as the as energy and gas prices are considered. Oil has a whole, a one price for the whole world. There's a world market price. But gas ha has, after the shale gas revolution in the USA, the gas price of in the USA is 30% of the gas price in Germany. And the electricity price is far lower than in Europe. And there are differences across Europe. And I stand by the information that we will see a reindustrialization in the USA, especially in uh, the raw material production, ceramics, copper, aluminium, uh, cement, paper, steel, high-tech, textile. All of these sectors will see growth. We always talk about the competitiveness of Europe and I can only say that energy and industry are heavily connected and how can a smart energy policy in Europe 
how can we maintain this? When we talk about growth projects these days, uh, how can we maintain this if we don't address, address the, the topic of prices? There has to be an energy policy that is an energy pricing policy to maintain or rather actually manage to require growth in our industries currently. In the European uh, BIP, we only have 18% industry. There are countries like France, who went from 19 to 13% in 10 years. Germany, the Netherlands, Austria have managed to maintain the industrial part of their BIP. And I would like to offer a proposal. We have three goals for 2020, all very important, all very nice. But I, I demand a 20% industry target. We, we are now at 18. And if we now set as an objective to reach 20% industry in the European BIP for 2020, it's an ambitious but feasible project which would help the labor market a lot more than all other goal and a lot of other goals combined. And this shouldn't exclude shale gas. I think it's premature, I respect it, but I think it's premature when countries like France generally declare that shale gas does not play a role. Maybe those ambitious countries, who are also new member states, uh, who are going up, like Poland, should lead the charge here as far as testing this is concerned. There are projects, in, may, may, there might be projects in Poland where we could get smarter, get more informed about this and also increase acceptance in other countries for, this, for that kind of project. That way, Shagas might actually get a chance in two or three years. You are perfectly right if you talk about short-term, mid-term and long-term perspectives for gas and the security of investments. Who inv anyone who invests in a pipeline, uh, as is being done here, can only find trust and acceptance for, for a billion euro investment when they get a planned security for 20 plus years of security. A gas power station needs 15 to 20 years of guaranteed functioning. Uh, a pipeline 20 to 35 years to actually be valuable and rentable. Which means there will be new pipeline if gas is not sustainable for 20, 30, 20, 40, 20, 50 in the European energy mix, and not as a fringe actor, but a, but a notable role in the European energy mix. If you say that in 2050 you, will on, you only want renewables, or in 2040, you won't get this. Because the renewable energies now need gas to actually function, and if we don't get gas, because nobody will invest to just, to just close the gap for 10 or 15 years. It's, that does not make this investment worthwhile. If so, we have to recognize the necess necessity to uh, agree to this long-term fossil fuel investments to encourage investors to actually be able to support, to actually allow us to do, uh, to switch to renewable energy sources in some countries, we actually need a speed limit for the conversion to, to renewable energy because in some countries it, where they just act too fast in a, in, a, in a manner that's not controlled enough, that's actually almost reckless. And then, and that's, I, I would like this to, make, to be my closing statement, we have a clear structure. We need a clear structure for our interior market. We would like to show where do we come from, where are we now, how does this interior market work? Where does it work? How is the distribution? And one thing is clear, that especially in a time of crisis, there is a risk 
that that energy restarts to be seen as a control instrument that sub uh, subsidies might come up and that the forces of the market lose their influence and we now need recognition we now need an affirmation that we agree to the mar to the energy market and if the european council uh, asks us to switch to renewables for 2040 and that's a very nice sunday talk but from monday to saturday they all work on the absolute opposite of this demand. They are talking and they are asking questions about paradise, but they work in the completely opposite direction. We are thinking about a fourth interior market package. But the uh, implementation on the basis of existing European law, law with, including the complete uh, that that uh, co-financing is completely forbidden is perfectly possible. It should also be possible to talk about it and to give limited subsidies to the member states but in a digressive program and limited, which would just mean that we m slightly modify our interior law uh, subsidy regulation. State aid. And this should allow better co-financing for member states. I thank you very much, and I wish you a nice seminar. Later, we will ask the economy if they see problems with co-financing, as you said, because there are enough projects. As the Connecting Europe facility. Vielen Dank, Herr Kommissar, dass Sie hier waren. Das war sehr interessant, das zu hören. Und jetzt fahren wir fort mit... ...and implications for the EU. Um, Dr. Fatih Birol will give us um, these information, which are very important. Perhaps they are additional information. Perhaps, um, so we are... You have the floor, sir. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, the Mr. Commissioner gave an excellent overview of the European gas market today and the plans and the challenges for the next years to come. What I will try to do in the next 15, 20 minutes is to highlight what is going on in the global gas markets and what could be the implications of those on the European energy markets in general and gas markets in particular. Some of you may know, uh, and Mr. Verhofstadt indicated that, last year, in the context of World Energy Outlook, we published a report called, Are We Entering a Golden Age of Gas? With a question mark. Why question mark? We didn't question the, the resources, gas resources worldwide, mainly as a result of shale gas, they are increasing. We did not question the economics of uh, uh, gas markets, but the question was mainly because of a roadblock in front of the unconventional gas development, namely the challenges coming from environmental and social concerns vis-a-vis -vis the production of shale gas. So, when you look at the worldwide, the technological advances in the United States and Canada, as one of the colleagues, in fact, two colleagues indicated in their questions, led to a major surge in the shale gas production. And several countries in the world are taking this development seriously and they want to increase their unconventional gas production as well. Most important among those, in terms of the size and in terms of the seriousness, is China. Followed by Australia, there are all the major projects going on in Australia. They are all uh, physically uh, going on projects. In Europe, uh, I will come in a minute, and in Latin America. 
However, there are some concerns that the shale gas production may cause some local environmental and social questions. And in many cases, those concerns are legitimate concerns. And uh, when you uh, look at the some cases, you see that the shale gas production may have implications for the use of water, land use, water contamination, and the uh, in terms of methane, a very potent uh, greenhouse gas uh, for the uh, climate change. These are real concerns. However, the good news is these problems, these concerns can be nullified or minimized with the existing technologies. You do not need to discover suddenly a new technology to address these challenges with the existing ones, but you need the right regulatory framework, you need the right rules to be applied. And therefore, we think if those rules are rightly applied in terms of the water, in terms of the chemical additives, in terms of uh, uh, the uh, methane linkages, these problems can be solved and the shale gas revolution can get a social license to operate. We have two weeks ago uh, uh, have this report, golden rules for a golden age of gas. What kind of rules have the governments, operators need to follow in order to produce shale gas in an environmentally benign manner? And if it happens, if the shale gas devolution takes place, if this roadblock is removed, what are the implications? Implications are we will still see growth of conventional gas, but we will see a major growth of unconventional gas. It will be two times higher than the conventional gas production. We will still see Middle East, Russia, as the traditional exporters to export uh, gas. However, we will see that the bulk of the growth of global gas production will come from China, United States, Australia, and other countries. I would like to bring to attention here the issue of China. About seven years ago, in the World Energy Outlook, we said, please pay attention to China in terms of coal. China will be one day a coal importer. At that time, it was something like saying that Saudi Arabia will import oil because China was a major coal uh, uh, exporter, and today China is importing coal. Again, I want to bring to attention that please pay attention to China. China may well be a soon a major gas producer, perhaps not an exporter, but a producer, because Chinese government now put a major target in their five-year plan to increase the shale gas production with some policies supported in terms of the subsidies for shale gas production and uh, others. So if this happens, if this growth uh, happens, if the shale gas revolution happens, it will have major implication for the global LNG, global uh, gas markets. Now, one question comes, as uh, Mr. Commissioner indicated, and some of the colleagues have concerns, if gas grows so strongly, are we going to lose our uh, uh, fight in terms of having more renewables in the uh, markets? This is a legitimate question, but my answer is not necessarily. It depends on the governments. And I will give you another forecast, but I will tell you what happened. This is example, evidence, in the United States in the last five uh, years. You see here, in terms of electricity generation, natural gas increased substantially, and what decline is coal. And the renewables increase also substantially in the United States together with natural gas. If the governments continue their support for right renewable projects, we can well see a cohabitation to living together of uh, 
natural gas and uh, renewables together. So this is the growth of natural gas does not necessarily mean the death of renewables if the governments, I underline here, if the governments take the necessary uh, uh, measures. Now, climate change, one of the colleagues asked in a very right way, if the uh, uh, gas grows, what will be the implications for climate change? Are we going to give up our climate change targets? Before going to future, I want to again go to past. And I want to ask one question uh, to all of us here. In terms of the carbon dioxide emissions in the last five, six years, the country which reduced the CO2 emissions the most in the world is the country where there is not a very strong climate policy, which is the United States. US emissions declined more than Europe in the last five years. I am not saying here that the US is doing a lot for climate change. So I am, US has to do major efforts in order to fulfill its obligations. This is one, before some colleagues jump in the subject, let me preempt this question and saying that US has to make major efforts to fulfill its requirements. But there is a point here that we have to learn. This happens because of two reasons. One, the current administration in the United States has successfully introduced efficiency standards for cars and trucks in order to reduce the oil demand. This helped the oil demand to go down, very obvious numbers, and at the same time CO2 emissions. And second, you may remember the slide I showed you a few minutes ago, gas replacing coal was the second factor why we saw a major drop in the US carbon dioxide emissions. So therefore, we have to be rather careful when we look at the role of gas. And once again, I do not say that the US with this completed its uh, uh, task, still much work to do, and gas alone will never ever bring us to a two degrees trajectory that we would like to see. But it can play a role, positive role, when it replaces coal, as it is the case in the US, and hopefully, as it will be the case in China. Now, there was a question, and uh, Mr. Commissioner also asked, is shale gas revolution going to, uh, in the future, going to uh, affect Europe? The answer is no. It is not future. It is already affecting the Europe. And I will give you one example, which I found very telling. When we look at the uh, world, when, uh, the, in terms of climate change, the most climate conscious governments are in Europe and Commission and the European Union countries are making major efforts to address the climate change question. And we all know that the most polluting fuel in terms of uh, climate change is coal. And when you look at the year 2011, last year, this is the growth of coal demand in different uh, regions. It, it declined in Japan, it declined in the United States, Russia. Worldwide, it is about 5%, and Asia, mainly China, grows significantly. But the, the region or the country which has the second highest growth in coal and higher than the world average was European Union. This is the data. You cannot, anybody cannot debate this. And I tell you what is the reason for that. The reason is the following. You will remember that the, in the US, gas was penetrating the US uh, uh, markets. And therefore, a lot of coal was going out of the US uh, markets because of the shale gas penetration of the US. And that coal has been exported to Europe and availability of coal uh, crashed the European coal prices, and they were so cheap, and in the presence of very low carbon prices, people shift to coal. And gas demand in the year 2011 in Europe declined by 11% when back to the level of the year 2000, 11 years back. 
So therefore, what I want to say, that the, what is happening in the shale gas, these are only the, the, the first signals, is affecting Europe, will affect Europe, and will affect everybody, whoever you are, even if it stays only in the United States if it doesn't go through. Another point is about the uh, gas prices. There is a huge another effect, of course, on the uh, uh, shale gas revolution between the region, gas prices. It is in United States a bit higher than $2 and uh, Europe and Japan. Huge, huge, huge differences. You may not be familiar with the gas prices, but if I have a, uh, give oil, which is uh, uh, numbers are better known, which would mean the oil prices today in the United States are about $80, which would mean that in Europe we are using oil about $400 per barrel, and uh, in Japan, uh, in Asia, $560 per barrel. So there are big differences. And what does this mean? This means if it continues like this, this picture, the competitiveness of the US economy will increase significantly in terms of industries using gas as an input and more importantly, sometimes we forget it, electricity prices will be positively affected as gas as a cheap input will go to electricity system and electricity will be cheaper vis-a-vis -vis other competitors and, and Europe and Japan and others will lose if the price differential stay as uh, they are. Now let me finish my uh, brief presentation by telling you, trying to put my uh, thoughts together. If those golden rules are applied, and if we see a shale gas revolution worldwide, starting with the United States, continuing in China, and maybe in uh, Europe and elsewhere, we will see a golden age of gas with its implications and overall in the, in, in the uh, world. And uh, I believe unconventional gas can uh, transform the energy markets because the greater availability of gas, more and more gas, will put downward pressure on the prices, which is a good news, at least as consumers. I, I am a consumer, and uh, I think from that point of view, it's a good news. And, and second, there will be new producers. There will be more diversity. Uh, traditional exporters today will be losing uh, as there will be new producers uh, coming, new exporters coming in the market. In other words, shale gas revolution is a good news for the consumers and importers and a bad news for the traditional exporters. In terms of Europe, the, uh, as uh, Mr. Commissioner mentioned, the prospects are still uncertain. There are significant resources in uh, Poland, and there, there's a very good uh, prospect in Poland, but other places such as uh, uh, Ukraine, Germany, and Eastern Europe, we see that. But even no growth comes in the Europe, unconventional gas, what happens outside of Europe will affect European gas and energy markets. Once again, natural gas can play a role in the road to low carbon technology, but if, especially if it replaces coal, but alone it will never ever bring us to a two degrees trajectory, the trajectory that we would like to see. And for that, we would need more energy efficiency, radical changes in energy efficiency, more renewables and other technologies such as uh, uh, nuclear power and CCS, which are zero carbon technologies. Thank you very much for your attention. <coughs> Vielen Dank, Herr Dr. Birol. Wir kommen nun zum Dr. Seele. Dr. Seele ist der Vorstandsvorsitzende Wintershall, einer derjenigen, die mit der Gazprom zusammenarbeitet. Und, und, äh, and how we just heard, there's going to be a golden age of gas, as more specifically shell gas. And how we heard from the commissioner, North Stream, South Stream, there are these are billions, well, projects worth billions. Is it still profitable 
to invest in these projects as there's going to be liquid gas shale gas on the market that's going to lower the gas price. And I'm very curious about what you're going to say, Dr. Seeler. Thank you very much, Mr. Kreutzmann, Dr. Barrel. I would like to talk to you about my personal experience on the market as an investor. First of all, it's decisive for us to see the long-term perspective uh, in natural gas consumption and production. And my point of view is slightly different. First of all, I will say that we are not going to see a, a huge increase in consumption of natural gas in Europe. Even if you have this image here where the consumption goes from 505 billion cubic meters to 570 billion cubic meters, I have to admit that the year 2011 is an exception because the, uh, the year before we were at 550 billion cubic meters, so it's going to be just a moderate growth. How do I reach this conclusion? We as consultants always present, with all, have been for years presenting these gross graphics. And, and I first of all have to admit, I don't see any investors on the market, particularly not in Germany, who are deciding right now their investment policy. So in the next three to five years, we're not going to see an, uh, a, uh, a mentionable increase and uh, gas con natural gas consumption as far as energy production is concerned. Uh, another reason why these investment decisions aren't taken are the state interventions in the markets. As far as the feed-in regulation uh, in Germany, they w which are a priority, uh, as the Commissioner mentioned before, these uh, gas power stations can only run on 1,500 megawatt hours uh, a year, and that's not just not profitable. Even if you count uh, on a very low gas price, if you only use this power station for 15% of the year, it's just insufficient. It's if the state has already intervened, it has to continue to intervene because it's not trusting in the market. And so they have to continue to intervene to not risk supply security. We also see um, a sharp decline in the natural gas production in Europe. And looking forward to the year 2020, the first thing that you can see on this graph is that when we talk about supply security in Europe, then we cannot afford the comfort to renounce the potential of shale gas. Unless you want to, to uh, increase the dependency on gas imports, from which the European Union already suffers. I would like, however, to compromise um, as far as shale gas is concerned. There's a lot of talk about it, but the first results we get from Hungary and Poland you might remember Exxon, as a huge company, has recently decided to not to uh, to discontinue drilling for shale gas in Poland, and first results are really not encouraging. We must explore the potential, and we have to see if this is economically viable. And from now to 2020. I don't think there's going to be a substantial shale gas production in Europe because we simply do not have the legal framework and not the, and the necessary, necessary planning hasn't been done yet. So we're going to have to import natural gas. You can see the different regions where this comes from. I suppose I suppose that Norway is going to maintain their position as well as Northern Africa. But we have to admit that there are certain insecurities in Northern Africa. The LNG, so the liquid natural gas importations, are for me a balance point, a balancing imports uh, from, as well from the European as, as from the global perspective. And the highest gross potential, which is the import for the European markets, is, and the highest gross potential, is, are the Russian uh, exporters. 
The production potential in Russia is clearly there for very simple reasons. Russia has huge natural gas reserves which are right next door. We as a producer are active in West Siberia and we know that Russia increases increasingly invites uh, foreign investors for gas production just so we bring technology into country to make the production more efficient and to increase exploitation. The European technology is needed, so they want it. Uh, if we want to import more gas, we need to the, uh, the infrastructure for it, not only for a higher total uh, quantity, but also to secure the, the sufficient imports and to risk to 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 um, reduce risk in transit. You on this graph you see three main import routes for Russian gas. The southern corridor. That's the most important conduit so, uh, through Ukraine, uh, Czech Republic, and Turkey, and then you have the European conduit to, uh, through uh, Poland. And then you have the northern, the North Stream pipeline. The only pipeline that's a direct connection between the European Union and the production country of Russia, which is why this pipeline is the most secure uh, pipeline of, 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 uh, of gas transport, because there's no risk involved with transit countries. So this is the most secure pipeline. I'm uh, for. I'm responsible as investment as an investor in both pipelines. For the southern pipeline, South Stream, there's a huge potential to reach the southeastern European markets, so the younger European member states, to provide those with better supply security, higher a higher quantity of natural gas, and here as well, there's a direct connection of those markets with the European with the Russian source. So that's why we invest in the Northern End Thousand Pipeline. They recognize this project and bilateral contracts and have agreed to this to, real, to make sure this project will be realized. And we as investors are completely resolved to build this pipeline because it highly increases our supply security for the European markets. We're in the phase where we are working on the planning and the decision as far as the investment goes will be taken by the end of the year and we are optimistic, let me tell you. Not only because we consider the investment risk as feasible, the one that the Commissioner mentioned, there's already a pipeline, the Blue Stream pipeline that is in the Black Sea and we have proven that, that such a pipeline is technically feasible. We've shown it. And what I wish for from the European Commission is that he doesn't stay neutral, but positive, that he supports this project, because every new import pipeline for gas for Europe has an incredible value for Europe, as per, uh, this pipeline as well. And the uh, the priority shouldn't be reduced because it's gas from Russia. This gas burns, uh, burns just as well as gas from the Caspian Sea. And I'm certain that even the, produ that as the production capacities over there uh, could find a way to, uh, to, f to build a similar pipeline to Europe. The Nabucco pipeline that has been mentioned, I have to say, is of extremely high value to the European Union. And I'm saying this even though I'm not at all involved in that project. This project has the huge advantage of connecting Europe to a new supply source. But we have to see that, that the consortium it has been trying for six years to tap that source and no long-term contracts have been signed yet. We are active in the Caspian region, in the oil and gas production, and we know that these countries are over-contracted in a way, and that it will be very difficult to contractually secure higher quantities, 
but I'm of course I of course wish you luck because it would be good for Europe as a whole. When we talk about investment, ladies and gentlemen, I have to tell you, and I do not want to criticize you, but I would like to say the plea that you that you create a framework that attracts more investments for our industry. The, the current framework is just not in favor of investments. And my personal experience with the current framework is frustrating. Why? I would like to enumerate three points that, that according to me, should be improved on. First, if we invest in a regulated manner into the infrastructure and pipelines, then there must be an attractive prop, uh, profitability for the investment capital in Europe. Currently, I have to guarantee a profitability of 3 to 4% after taxes to my investors. And as far as the competition for capital is concerned, uh, this is going to be difficult because we can't draw from the capital markets to invest in to the regulata into regulated uh, pipelines if the profitability is not increased. With the current margins, I can't motivate an investor for this project. We need, secondly, a faster uh, authorization system. I'm, I brought you an example, the example of the Opel pipeline uh, that connects Nord Stream to the Czech Republic and that goes through Germany and we've been, we've needed three years to become investment security for this project. Three years were needed for the German authorities and Russian authorities to just communicate to us that yes, we are, you are going to receive authorization from government. And I would also like to ask you if a criterion for the exemption of authorities, authorizations is really acceptable, so that, that there is only um, an exemption if there's only transit and no actual import. Mm -hmm. I would like to summarize my uh, experience to the sec second point, and I'm immediately connected to the third point. We have to pay attention that we give property rights to investors so that they can access the capacities in the manner in which they invest. By which I mean that I see a clear need that we must gain access for at least for our own needs if we invest to create capacity. I'm going to give you a, a more hands-on example. Just imagine for a second that you build a house and in this house you design it the way you like it. A nice living room, a perfect bedroom and then there's a regulatory authority and they tell you you have a beautiful house, I really like it, I like, I like your mattress in your bedroom but I think you shouldn't be allowed to sleep in your own bedroom. And then there's a third person you, don't, you might not even know and who tells you that this bedroom is not available for you and this third person uses your bedroom and tells you that your mattress is not comfortable and he paid a price to the regulation authority, a, a very attractive price, but the next day he complains that your mattress is not comfortable for him. And then the regulation authority tells you that you have to change your mattress. And it wouldn't, uh, won't allow you to increase the price. Would you even build such a house? That's the experience that I've, that I've lived through with the Opel pipeline. We've invested a billion euros into the construction of this pipeline before we built it. We addressed the regulation authority and uh, we start an open season demand or question which other parties would like to use this pipeline. No one answered except for one company 
which disclosed 100% of capacities. And we build it especially, uh, exactly according to these capacities because it's the only answer we received. Then we received the authorities without, ex uh, without further demands from the German authorities. And then it went to Brussels and the European Commission uh, gave us further regulations we had to respect. Um, so we can only use five, our, our main client can only use 50% of the capacities, but they can uh, sell gas if they want to use more, which leads to the result that 50% of, of the capacity of this pipeline are not in use. I myself, as an investor, only get half of the receipts due to this reglementation and I, I'm asking the market who would like to use this 50% and the result is not surprising because there were no clients for this before I built it and there are no new clients now, that, now after we built it. So this is negative profitability. This is really not encouraging for further investments in pipeline infrastructure. No. Of course I heard when uh, the commissioner said that there might be a financing by Brussels but the f economic incentives in such a in such a manner are, are not present for us investors with such with such a result I cannot incentivate potential investors to continue investing in such projects I would like to conclude with some key phrases. What do we need to guarantee and to strengthen supply security in Europe? We need energy partnerships along the whole value chain. Europe must become a pro producer. It must invest into transit pipelines and it must also prepare its markets for competitiveness and this can be created only this can be done only uh, through energy partnerships with all producers especially with Russia we must continue to diversify supply but also the transit routes and of course we also must diversify the um, the routes with Russia because we do have interruptions there we have to treat single projects in a non-discriminatory way all projects should that contribute to supply security in Europe should be supported by the European Union. We need planning reliability. We cannot wait for three years for an authorization of a project. And we also need to have our free market again. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Seele. I would now like to open the floor and the discussion for questions from the floor to the panel participants. One question. When we say that the European Union uses only 50% of capacities, then we can reply, certainly there will be investments. But of course, private investments are priority. What can we do to try to take up the dialogue again with the European Commission and to avoid that such things happen also in the future? And that the uh, National Regulatory Authority says, yes, of course, you can use 100% of capacities. And the European Commission says, no, it's a deterrent if you have no planning security. Or you say, uh, European Commission, would you like to support our projects? So please co-finance these projects. But in this case, the money will ru run out quite quickly, the money um, made available by the European Commission through the Connecting Europe facility. Of course, this is almost almost um, I can't even think of it. This would be a very fair approach uh, on my side from an investing investor's point of view. But I think we must be open for discussion when there are rules which we cannot apply, which we cannot implement, and when this leads to uh, the investors losing out on money, then we need a compromise. And I could imagine that the Commission, for example, could offer a compromise, um, offering a possibility to, for example, 
every two or three years uh, to ask the market if there are potential transporters, um, companies that are interested in transport capacities, and when there are none, then we will most probably have alternatives, otherwise we don't make any profit. I would like to see this possibility. I would like the Commission to give it to me. Thank you very much. Are there other questions for Dr. Biron or Dr. Seele? No questions? One more question on my side. You have already alluded to the fact that there is an incrementation of 600 billion in the market. You see it a little slower. What about carbon capturing and storage? In Europe, we don't have the necessary technology in, in Germany because all of the states are contrary to this. Do you think this might be a deterrent for investors that there are high costs involved? And you also said in the gas market for gas power plants there are no investors. Gazprom had, might have had an interest once. But as I have read recently, their plans for a 3,000 megawatt power plant in Bavaria to guarantee independence when phasing out of nuclear energy. What do you think about this? We must be aware of the fact that when you use CCS, carbon capture and storage, as, a, as an obligation, then this will not uh, give you more profitability because as a manager of a power plant carrying out the investment, you need more investments to take the CCS component on board as well. CCS, however, is a topic that we cannot uh, just use anywhere as we like. No, you need to have the geological basis to be able and you need the storage facilities. In Europe, we don't have many areas which are available for storage and for CCS in general. But of course, in the end, there will be technological successes, but this will also require investments in a certain uh, quantity. And since we also spoke of uh, profitability for power plants, well, I think without subsidies, this will not be possible unless the partner, that is the gas producer, is uh, willing to feed in the gas on a price that is not really uh, attractive for him anymore. So I think we need to find solutions in a way that the, 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 the low use of gas power plants must be refunded in a way, must be repaid in a way. Of course, I am worried to see that Germany is investing more into coal than into natural gas. The reason is simple. Uh, the coal plants are used with seven or eight thousand hours per year. This, uh, you cannot apply the same for a gas power plant. When you combine the two in a modular way to also combine them and use them complementary to renewable energies, when we want, when we decide in Europe that we want to be on a road towards green energy and when we want to step up the part of renewables energies, then we really need to also take account of the second element. That is, we want to have, we need to have a flexible solution to maintain gas power plants. On the other hand, if you grant an initial subsidy, an initial financial um, support to gas, to renewable energies, then you need to do the same for gas. Ich denke, dass climate change. But as important as it is, as crucial as it is, 
I have to tell you that the appetite for CCS is declining for two reasons. First, the, if you don't have a carbon price, which would give an a incentive for such high cost technologies, you can do as much as regulation, you can do as much as push, it will not fly. Second, whatever Europe does on CCS, to be honest with you, in the uh, climate change context does not matter alone. We have to see CCS in China, US, India, the major coal and fossil countries. And I can tell you that in China today, you, can, uh, it, uh, you have big difficulties to convince the Chinese to produce electricity six times more expensive in the absence of a financial compensation. So it is important, it is crucial, but the appetite is not there at all. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions? Herr Weber, yes, please, and you. Yeah, Wolfgang Weber from the BSF. Wolfgang Weber, another question which has just been discussed in between you. What would be the right ways of design for the market to create more incentives? For example, for gas power plants. Do you have any ideas? Susanne Rompel, RVV uh, here in Brussels, office in Brussels. Dr. Attica spoke about, Commission Attica spoke about shell gas, and I would be interested what Dr. Seeles' view is for shell gas for Europe and uh, for Germany in particular. We're all, Fatty, you drew attention to the uh, impact of. Uh, American developments on European markets with low coal prices. I think you could equally have mentioned uh, high gas prices drawing LNG cargoes into Japan to replace Fukushima. As an outsider, when you look at the European Union making rules about its own markets, do you think that the European Union pays enough attention to the impact of global markets on its domestic energy world? We start with Dr. Pierrot and then Dr. Seeler, please. So these are a very uh, touchy questions. Perhaps I should make a disclaimer. With all respect to our colleagues here, I am neither German, nor uh, belong to any political party, nor <laughs> I am a supporter of natural gas. So this is uh, to make it clear. I have the same arm length to all the uh, uh, fuels. So starting from uh, 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 that, uh, with Mr. Blake is uh, going from the backwards. The, uh, I think Europe, has to understand that the, even though it's a big market, uh, over 500 million uh, 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 population, the Europe will not determine what is going to uh, happen in the energy markets uh, globally, but the global energy markets will determine what is going to happen in the European uh, energy markets. So this is, I think, first thing I wanted to say. The same applies to climate change. In Europe, we discuss a lot. In fact, in the European Parliament, I uh, uh, follow these uh, uh, discussions with uh, great pleasure, uh, Mr. Chairman. For example, should Europe reduce the emissions 20% 2020 or 30%? There's a huge debate between the parties, debates, and, and so on. And I want to, give, uh, to get to back to my uh, uh, the, uh, favorite example. The difference between the 20% of Europe uh, CO2 emission reduction and 30% CO2 emission reduction is equal to one week of emissions of China. So just to show you how uh, uh, good the debating is, but what it means for the, uh, in the global climate uh, uh, debate. So uh, therefore, to uh, understand, I think there is a need for Europe to understand better and better what is going on in the international markets in terms of uh, gas, uh, oil, and others. But uh, where we are now, I would like to urge our European colleagues to look at the, the uh, gas market developments, uh, not to be too late to, uh, to benefit uh, from that, if not to uh, be disadvantaged by uh, being uh, late. Uh, shale gas, uh, uh, in uh, many countries in the Europe, we have shale gas resources, uh, we have in uh, in uh, Poland, and there is a, a very strong program in Polish government is uh, uh, pushing ahead. 
In, in France, in Germany, the BGR recently made a, a statement on the uh, resources which are on the optimistic side. Uh, there may be a few uh, 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 question marks, as Mr. Zele mentioned, but we had these question marks also in the United States. What I'm saying is that even in Europe, we do not produce one BCM of unconventional gas. Still, what is going on in the rest of the world will affect the European energy markets. So therefore, coming to the, uh, the last question of the, uh, 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 that uh, uh, you just asked, Europe has to follow what is going on in international uh, gas uh, markets, even though there is no growth there, and I believe there will be a growth. Europe cannot be just sit back and watch because of the, uh, because of the regulations and because of the begin slave of the uh, regulations. And what kind of market design? Very simple answer. Just uh, make the, uh, the market principles uh, to uh, dominate the game, not the uh, political uh, wishes. And of course, with an eye on the security of supply and our most important objective of addressing the climate change. So these are some comments from me. Dr. Seyler. Ich möchte mit der I would like to address the question according to the power stations. We have two possibilities to increase profitability, and that depends on state intervention. First of all, you can try to secure a minimum functioning duration, so that's a minimum feed in quantity, so there's a priority reglementation as we know it for the renewable energies, then you could uh, get a uh, attack by the angle of the, of the energy price, uh, so that the price should be modified just as it is with renewable energies. And the other component is that as far as the feed in is concerned, that you would like to that you should secure low prices. That is why Bavaria has chosen Gazprom as a producer, so to get a higher possibility to realize these power stations. The question about shale gas in Europe. I would like to answer from the point of view of a of a producer. If I look at the world map. And if I uh, represent a multinational international company, then there are three regions that are highly attractive when I talk about shale gas. One, USA. It's what everyone's been talking about. It's the origin of shale gas. It's where everybody went to learn the necessary technology. The second region, and there there are... Uh, das ist China. There are more net, more natural shale gas, there's more resources in China than even more than in the USA. And the third region is Argentina. I myself am active as a producer in Argentina and there we are uh, having some trouble with the political framework and then far behind. And that's for reasons of the size of the available resources then only far off on fourth place there's Europe because there is just not as much as in the other three regions we don't see the same geology we see in other countries you cannot approach it the same way you can't say it's shale gas here it's shale gas there there's going to be exactly the same procedure of extraction that's not how it works we have to first have an exploratory phase we are currently ju really just starting out with this. If we want to exploit this potential, uh, we have to construct a, a service infrastructure in Europe after the exploratory phase. And there's enormous need for infrastructure. In the US, there are thousands of drillings per year. In Europe, we're talking about 60 to 80 a year. And you have to consider that, as far as the subject of sale gas is concerned, uh, the, the, is that the European Union is much more densely populated than the USA. So there is uh, the problem of acceptance. And the concerns of a population have, of course, to be taken seriously. 
because there is concern that we might pollute water and that the extraction procedure that, uh, that uh, doesn't allow us to master the necessary technology. Now uh, there has to be some self-criticism in our own industry because it's a very complicated topic and we should really uh, attract the public's attention on the, uh, on the difficulties. So in the short term, we won't see a big production in shell gas in Europe because there's, not, there's insufficient security. Only when we have a certain security that we will be able to explore and exploit the resources in Europe, only then in the mid and long term might we see some shale gas production in Europe. Uh, last comment as far as the global perspective is concerned that has been mentioned before. If I look at China as a power-hungry country, that they have a global security now they think secure global energy at the source. And I would like to ask the question, should Europe allow itself to just sit quietly and wait and see if everything turns out right? European companies must act internationally as far as oil and gas production directly at the source. It's a strategy that the Asian companies show us, they, they, they've proven it works, and we need the political support, political most of all, to follow a similar strategy in a competitive way to secure energy for us. Thank you very much. Further questions to one of our distinguished panelists, please. Hello, uh, I would like to uh, I apologize for taking you a little bit back for the... Uh, first of all, my name is Gilad Segal. I'm from the Israeli mission to the European Parliament. And I would like to take you a little bit uh, early on the debate uh, as, for the, as for the sources of... Uh, diversity of sources of gas. Well, uh, I, I mean, nowadays the potential of gas in the Eastern Mediterranean, which is uh, the commissioner at, uh, talking about the uh, southern Cyprus, uh, but uh, the, the proven gas reserves and the estimated potential inside Israel is about, uh, I, knew, I, I knew about 200 uh, TCF. Now I see on the internet it's 1,000, and it's, keep getting gr uh, it's growing and growing. Uh, nowadays, Israel uh, energy sector is uh, dependent about 50% on, uh, on, uh, on uh, natural gas. And uh, I would like to ask the experts, uh, how do you think, I mean, Considering, I mean, of course, it's small size compared to the to the other resources, but still, how do you see the the potential of uh, building a pipeline, or maybe through LNG, uh, and uh, you know, and and to diversitize the, this furthermore? Thank you, Dr. Zeder. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, in Israel, it was one of the major discovery we have seen in the last years and therefore I congratulate you because you can turn Israel into an exporting country for natural gas. The only way, especially that Israel is not depending on gas imports from Egypt, is the huge potential to develop these gas reserves in the first instance. I think this should be the main driver developing these gas reserves in Israel so that your domestic demand of gas will be supplied by the gas field you have offshore in Israel. If you would like to use these re reserves for an international activity, for example, to support, supply the European gas markets, the pipe distance is by far too long. But LNG is going to be a potential outlook for you if you would like to develop these huge gas fields. What I would recommend is that Israel, given that special technology is needed to develop these gas reserves, is inviting competent EMP companies from the Western world. Just contact the European and the American companies, for example, to build a consortium, which is able also to cover the huge investment costs necessary to really bring the gas on stream. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions? Please. 
Um, ich will fragen, welche... I would like to ask what kind of role LNG is going to play in the future for the energy security of Europe. The microphone is not on, the translators can't hear him. Uh, what I'd like to say is that the currently uh, Europe gets a lot of uh, natural gas from a few number of uh, uh, countries, such as uh, Russia, such as uh, North Africa, such as uh, Norway. But uh, with the increasing number of potential exporters to uh, Europe, such as United States, such as uh, from uh, uh, Qatar and others, we may well see that there will be a diversification of uh, new suppliers. Plus, there will be, as uh, 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 the previous speakers uh, mentioned, there will be new pipelines coming from different uh, uh, suppliers, such as the one from uh, the Caspian uh, region, they will all help to diversify and address the energy uh, security uh, issue. I think with the increasing uh, shale gas resources, we have about to, today 250 years enough uh, gas. The uh, gas security is less of a problem now than it was a few years ago. It is still a, a, there's a security of gas supply issue, but it is less of a problem now compared to a few years uh, ago. But the security of oil is still something that we have to keep an eye on. Herr Dr. Seele, wollte noch das kommentieren. Also, ich, ich sehe, uh, I see it this way. In the short term, LNG the LNG share on the European market is going to go up because the price is attractive. But if we talk about supply security, then in the long term uh, we have to compensate for LNG. That's going to be contrary. And the prices along in Europe along with Asia, we can't be competitive. Our prices are, please excuse me to say it, are too low. But the uh, highest prices are at the moment uh, at the, on the gas market in Asia. And I know a lot of colleagues who currently develop uh, LNG uh, in Australia, because Australia has currently a gas boom, and before this investment is even done, the LNG is, even before the construction begins, already being sold to the, to the Asian markets, bound to the oil price. So a long-term LNG source uh, with current prices is just not interesting because I can't get rid of it at, uh, at current market prices. I need to thank you for your participation here on our guest seminar. Um, and I will thank you very much uh, to our panelists, Dr. Bierol and Dr. Seele. And also, I have heard that the commissioner is somebody here from the European Commission, so you can bring him the different um, yeah, um, questions we have to the commission. Thank you very much to join our seminar. I think it was a very interesting uh, debate we had. And I wish you all the best. Thank you.